Let's make sure we're live. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me today, this evening, tomorrow, yesterday, whenever, whenever you're watching this thing. I know people watch different times, different places. Uh, my name is Quinn Jacobson. I think you guys know who I am, at least some of you do. And uh, welcome to the Studio Q Show, the little piece of the world where we spend an hour talking about wet collodion here. You know what? I'm going to start off today. Um, and I hope everyone's doing uh, well, healthy, and happy. I'm only going to be able to spend an hour this morning because I have a, a skid, a track loader over on the property. And I got to get back over there and move some dirt today. So, you know what, though? I want to share I want to share a couple of photos of the property from yesterday. Um, we had our foundation poured. So our house is going to be, we'll probably be in our house in a couple of weeks. So we're excited. Hey, well, from Erie, PA, welcome. Good to see Jan and Thilo and Bogusla and Tim and Joffrey and everybody here. That's awesome. Welcome. And uh, we've got some people coming in on YouTube now. So that's great. Um, let me do this. I know this is uh, probably going to piss some people off, but skip through it if you don't want to see this. I'm going to share a couple of photos and a little video. Um, <laughs> I know you don't have to mandatorily watch this, but Facebook, no. Where's my uh, where's my uh, application window? Let me close this down. Let me try this again. I'll show you just a couple of photos and a little 30-second uh, video. Uh, a lot of you guys probably haven't even seen my property, to be honest with you. Jan says, hi, winter time is equal to what? Uh, oh, yeah, contact printing time here in Norway. What is the expected shelf life of a pre clothing chloride? You know what? That's an awesome question, Jan. Thank you for doing that, uh, asking that. I'll get to it in just a second here. Um, good afternoon, Linda. Good to see you. Welcome. Um, yeah, Jan has been out. Jan has let other people come in. So he's he's in here today, and it is good to see him. Let me try this again. Just two photos and a quick video here. <laughs> let me see if I can do it. Chrome tab, no? You're not going to let me do it? Huh. I thought I had my preview window open. Oh, maybe I need to have it all the way open. Here we go. There it is. So here's a couple of still photographs. So... This is uh, what you see. I'm parked up at the top of our property here, and this is our road going down in our house. This is a concrete pump truck here, uh, probably going, I don't know, way up there. I don't know how tall it was, but they're pumping uh, concrete into our forms. And there's our house, our foundation um, kind of layout, a little better shot there. Kind of nice views back there, right? There's Witcher Mountain, Cover Mountain. Beautiful beautiful views um let me share let me see if i can share my quick time video you know i'm a professional uh videographer when it comes to this now i'm trying to document everything on our everything we do i try to document I've, of course this is an iphone so does that play yeah so here they are pumping that concrete into our forms Woo! you know i know for most of you, it doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot. But for me, man, this is many, many years in the planning, many, many days going without stuff that I'd like to buy that I didn't to save my money. And, uh, man, to see this come to fruition is just amazing. Um, so I'm back over there today after we do this little show. And uh, they're pulling the forms and putting up the stem walls and, and all that kind of good stuff. So... Anyway, I wanted to share that with you guys. Just so I know, I've, I've had a couple of people ask, what's the status on your house? What are you doing? We're that far away. We're real close. <laughs> and obviously, I'll share some more as we get going. So back to the task at hand. I just, um, now I can say, go to this video in the first three minutes of it, watch it, and you'll see some photographs. But I did, I did do it on people are people know what's up oh wow uh oh thylas says how big is your property it's 12 acres uh 12 acres uh we have six on the front as you come in there and then we have these big rock out croppings and you go over to the other side it's six acres on the other side big chunk of property thanks jeffrey that's yeah it's it's amazing i wish uh i wish uh 
you could see it live. It's it's really amazing. It's it's super satisfying. I'm the general contractor on this job. Of course, we're doing our house. So I've had myself knee deep in all of this. I've learned so much. Um, how to build a house in the mountains in Colorado. I could write a book on it. I mean, things that you would never, ever imagine. Uh, costs, things that you would never put on your list of what it costs or how much time it takes or what needs to be done. I could write an entire book on building a, a house in Colorado. I've learned so much. And and we've done this all on the up and up, right? There's people that come to the mountains and they'll they'll go chop trees down and build a cabin and haul water in and you know, shit in a bucket and all that stuff. This has all been done legitimately through the county and the state of Colorado. So I'm all up and up. So I went through every single process, whether it's water or sewage or, you know, different materials, uh, uh, driveway, septic systems, all that stuff. It's, it's a huge deal. It's fun. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> and I surely wouldn't want to spend the money doing it again because um, I don't have it. <laughs> but but um, it's been a wonderful experience. I mean, I, I, I highly recommend it. If, if you can do it, do it. Um, and if you can't, you can, you know, work toward it. Anyway, back to hand, back to the uh, wet plate clothing and stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah, says winter time is equal to contact printing time here in Norway. That makes sense. It's a good time. You know, winter time is a good time. Old, old, uh, old school photographers back in the day in the 19th century, they wouldn't make photographs. Uh, in the winter time. They'd do two things. They'd print, they'd make paper, they'd print, and they'd clean and organize their dark rooms and stuff and their and their their play. So it is a good time to do, to uh, work on that um, printing out, you know, and that's true. As far as the shelf life on clothing and chloride, here's the here's the great news. Um, I've used that uh, clothing and chloride mixture, that emulsion um, almost a year old and works perfectly fine. So I'd say six months easily, Jan. Yeah, six months easily. You, you, no problem, especially if it's cool and dark and all those principles that we apply to all the other chemistry, oxidation and stuff. No problem. You're good to go. Wonderful printing out process. I encourage everyone to do it. For those of you, of you that don't know what Jan's talking about, he's talking about a, a an aristotype process, a collodial chloride process that actually uses uh, collodion as the binder, like egg whites for albumin or, um, you know, gelatin for, you know, oil and carbon prints. This binder is collodion. The very material we make the, the, the negative with is the binder for the print. It's usually on uh, a burrito paper, a paper, a berry. It's got kind of a solid rock layer.
Hey, Jan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was wondering, um, can you not shoot outside in the winter time? Is, is it just too cold or the exposure is too long? What's the what's the problem? Uh, it's uh, I can shoot in winter time on the cold. Uh, Cold, cold days, but uh, normally here at the uh, west coast, west coast of Norway, it, it's uh, it's so much raining and windy, so it's difficult to get the camera steady. And uh, okay, the exposure times uh, four times, five times normal in summer. So it's, everything goes, but uh, normally it's too strong wind and too much rain, and the equipment wet all over. So uh, I I do will do more uh, print uh, shooting with the portrait, some ideas, still life, and then I have a plenty of negatives I make uh, earlier because I normally know I make three plates: one tin type, one ampro type, and one negative. So I can make copies and everything for. Uh... I tend to do the same. Yeah, I tend to do the same. Yeah, that's yes, awesome. I... Yeah. 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 I will try, uh, Tim, uh, later on. I will try start with uh, uh, carbon print also, but I have to wait for uh, Dikromat. It's very difficult to get in Norway oh. dichromat because the poison. Oh, where where do you get it? I hope to get it from uh, Russia, oh. and then it's going uh, straight ahead. And I and the customs maybe I say to them and I use it that photo. So uh, okay, uh, so because uh, Norwegian government and uh, already. Uh, have my name on the explosive like collodium and uh, potassium nitrate and these things. So, so tell me, if you're in a foreign country, maybe whether it be Asia or Europe, is it hard to use Amazon? Can you guys use Amazon to get things? Or I use uh, Amazon UK. Oh, and, uh, okay. maybe this, maybe next year I start uh, Amazon Scandinavia, okay. Sweden, Denmark, Norwegian, Finland. I see. Yes, no problems. And what about um, a company called Artcraft Chemical? That's in New York. And yeah, they, but that's, that's a, you have a big problem because of the postage. Oh. Many things is uh, so uh, difficult to send by airplane because it's uh, you know uh, collodion is very uh, explosive. Oh. And you have uh, alcohol, 96, 99 percent. You can't send it with uh, airplanes, so you have to send it with boat, ship, and then it's very expensive. Ah. Same as from uh, UK, Great Britain. You cannot uh, send to Norway because I pay two times more for uh, postage than. Uh, yes, you understand. Oh, wow! Oh my goodness! Uh, so I buy from a firm. Uh, Called uh, Mammut Futu in uh, in Czechoslovakia. Oh, yes, little expensive, but uh, good stuff, and uh, they are cheap. Yeah, but uh, yes. If you guys, has anyone ever tried doing? Um You also stop up, uh, Tim. Not hear you. <laughs> Anybody over here now? Nothing. I just want to know how do you folks frame your uh, glass plates? Oh, yeah. I, I'm not finished about thinking about that because uh, I use. Uh, <laughs> I use uh, 
I use uh, glass painting with uh, okay. black acryl, acryl paint, yeah. spray paint. And then I set it over uh, like that. Okay. Yes. And then nice. it's uh, close to perfect because of the black <laughs> shining behind. Right. So you put so it in much inside. Yes, I think about silver. Yeah. Cool. Frame it. Good. And I use maybe a, a, a art paper, like right. uh, William Turner or something. I spray it to not get yellow. Spray okay. it to not get yellow, and then I said just. So I don't use uh, use uh, passepartout. I just take on a paper. Okay. Because it's built out the thickness. Right. But and how would I you have uh, the next? Next, I have spacers in the frame. Ah, yes, gotcha. 10 millimeter to the yeah. glass, and then okay. you got some depth and you have the built up on this side. That's oh. my uh, yeah, it's good, that's good. Nice. This is also the uh, same spray painted uh, glass with acryl paint, acryl paint on the back side, and this is the glass side, the painting side, and then I set over. It's difficult to see but the reflections. I must soon be finished to frame everything because I, I have a, before Christmas time, I have a place to uh, show my photos and sell them. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. I'm back. <laughs> Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> the world just blew up. I don't know what happened. <laughs> we lost him as well. We lost him as well. Maybe it's a Colorado thing. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe they're starting to nuke the world from the west coast of the U.S. and we're getting all wiped out over here. Well, Jeffrey should be gone too. Then he's in D.C. He should go before me. No, I don't know what happened. It's a beautiful, nice, beautiful, sunny day up here. I just went in. I'm out. I'm out in the remote uh, area here. I just went back into place and just rebooted everything. It seems to be okay. So, <laughs> no, no, no problem, uh, Quinn. We I, are I, talking, I, to talk I, about many things we <laughs> when you're yeah, away. I, I <laughs> thought you guys might find something to do. So I appreciate you hanging out with me, a small little glitch. But we'll move on. So the clothing chloride is, is that process where we use clothing as the binder and we put the strontium chloride, a little glycerin, all that stuff in it. And we make the paper and we, we do pot prints or printing out paper with it. Um, so a long, long shelf life on that for sure. And that's a great question uh, Jan just asked. Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, good morning, Doug. Good, good to see you, brother. I hope everything's well up your way. Um, Thanks, Linda. I appreciate it. it. It is, you know, the house is, it's fun to do, but only once. <laughs> I can only afford it once, too. <laughs> Barely that. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, Peter says he makes his own pot paper, not with collodion. Yes. So let, let's, that's a, that's a great topic, Peter. Let's just briefly, um, a lot of times we need to uh, the English word is uh, vernacular. We need to sort out the how, what words we use, the verbiage we use. Um, we need to kind of uh, we need to make sure we're talking about the same thing. So, having said that, Peter says I make my own pop paper, not with collodion. So, let's talk about what pop means. P O P. It's 
it's not like a soda drink. I know some Americans call it pop, right? Um, it's uh, pop is an acronym for printing out paper. Pop. We just call it pop. And pop is a big umbrella term. So albumin is a pop. Salt is a pop. Uh, um, Claudio chloride is a pop. Green has maybe a problem with interference with the equipment uh, out there. Bogislav, you see your uh, address to uh, Dikromat. No, I don't know if we can continue doing this. I'll try. If it does it again, I'm going to audio. Okay, guys, I, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I have no idea, but we'll keep on trucking. We'll see what we can do here. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a whole bunch of pop printing, right? That's that's all I'm saying. So when we say pop paper, it can be anything. I mean, printing out paper, meaning that you're not using an enlarger to make print. So yeah, burrito paper, you know, crowbar, uh, all kinds of all kinds of different um, all kinds of different papers to use. So anyway, um, and I don't see I don't see John in here. Um but we were going to share some of his stuff. Maybe he'll be. Oh, I think he told me. I think he told me he'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks. Anyway, so having the distractions going on, I'm kind of losing track of what I was going to talk about. But let's just do this. Let's. Uh, was there another technical question over here? I, I have to switch between YouTube and the private chat here. Um, so, yeah. Watch now that uh, now that we're not doing anything, it'll keep. I won't have an internet connection problem. So yeah, did any anybody want to do anything technical? Talk about anything technical, or want to address anything that uh, it, it kind of open thing, uh, open forum, and then we'll maybe look at some photographs if somebody has some. I can show you John's from he he uh, he sent it to me last week, and I didn't get to it. And then there's also. Um, another gentleman that sent me some work, but I don't see either one of them in here, but <clears throat> if somebody has some work, we'll look at, if not, that's okay too. We'll just continue on. Um, anybody have anything technical? Any, anybody want to talk about, um, any, um, technical, conceptual, anything you're working on, any questions you have about any particular, um, variant in this world that we're working in? Um, I, I've been looking at, not that I have a lot of uh, downtime, but I've been looking at uh, revisiting a lot of that primary literature on the process. And if you look at, if you search Google Books and you just search wet plate collodion and you look at everything, anything between like 1870 and 1890 is really good, solid information for the most part. 
And I find it interesting how many, uh, really, when you think about it, how many ways there are to do this process, the compounds, the methodology, um, and everybody gets a little bit of their own personal results. Like, like I can only show when I'm doing a workshop or when I did workshop. Or how to how to store things. I, it looks like it's going to go out on me again here. Um, but at the end of the day, what the bottom line is, what I try to do is I try to teach people the basic principles and then show them some of the techniques I use and then have them discover on their own what works best for them. And they're, you know, people think this is gospel, right? They think they, you know, people refer to to literature as Bibles and, and we use these words that ultimate authoritarian kind of thing. Um, there isn't in this process. You figure out how what it works for you or what works for you and how you want to work it. And if you're making plates and getting the results you want and you're being safe, that and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, it's not only getting the results you want and you can you can do this any way you want, but there's a caveat there. If it's unsafe, if you're doing something unsafe, and if you're ignorant about it and you're doing something unsafe, it's, uh, you know, there could be a price to pay not only for yourself, but your family and pets and neighbors and all that stuff. And, and you know, the community as a whole, if we had something bad happen, I mean, obviously it would get around the community and kind of throw, I would say, throw a wet towel over the whole process. But if you're safe, and you find a methodology to work in, that's, it's wonderful. That's, that's great. Um, one of the books, or not books, one of the articles that I would recommend, and this is what I was thinking this morning, if you haven't read this, and I know now for some reason people just don't read a lot. They don't, there seems to be something like, if I can't get it quick, and if I have to read more than a paragraph, I'm not interested, right? Too long to read, you know. What, what do you mean too long to read? If you're interested in, you'll read it, right? I'm, I'm. I tell you right now, I'm going through uh, Howard Zinn's the the uh, People's History of the United States of America. It's like a 700 page tome. Um, but anyway, if if <laughs> if you like to read or you believe in reading, pick up um, Bill Jay's, and you don't have to pick it up. It's a free PDF online. Search Bill Jay's. Dangers in the dark room. Dangers in the dark or dangers in the dark room. I can't remember. Somebody can Google that. This lays out all the ways the 19th century photographers died, primarily in wet collodion. Number one cause of death, explosions. Number two cause of death, poisoning, right? I mean, it's kind of obvious. Why explosions? Why do you think explosions? Anybody have any ideas on why explosions would be the... Uh, Dangers in the dark. There you go. Thank you, Thilo. Um, why do you think uh, explosions would be number one cause of death? Explosion there you go. Ether. What else? That, remember, in the 19th century, they didn't have these uh -huh. fancy, dan fancy uh, uh, furnaces, heaters for their houses. They used potbelly wood-burning stoves. So they basically had an open flame in their studio constantly. And so... This ether had come out, collodion, right? Collodion is primarily 70% plus ether. A little bit of cotton, a little bit of alcohol, right? 20% or so. And so you get this whole, uh, you get the um, open flame of their fireplace in their studio, and they're pouring collodion and having all these compounds and chemicals around. And, you know, those highly flammable and explosive materials with an open flame. It's just number one, just, you know, bad news. Number one cause of death, explosions. Um, on the other hand, there was also explosions not caused from ether or collodion or alcohol, those volatile, highly flammable materials. There's a product that's formed when you heat a silver bath up. And you're gonna, you'll read about this. I'm sure you've read about it on other forums. You talk about heating or boiling silver bath. All you need to do is Google silver fulminate and read what's in that to create silver fulm fulminate and the temperature that you need to hit. It's 80 degrees Celsius. Silver nitrate, nitric acid, alcohol. 
Those are the things you need to create silver fulminate. What is silver fulminate? Silver fulminate is probably one of the most explosive compounds there is. You can touch it, blow on it. Sometimes it'll blow up. Silver fulminate is real. I know there's a lot of people that heat their silver baths up. It's very effective. Worked well. It works well. Works great. Worked great in the 19th century. A lot of guys did that. But they also blew themselves up doing it sometimes as well, too. So there's always a risk involved. You could, you could argue back to me, and if you wanted to have a debate about this, a, 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 a premise that you could argue back to me or a, or a position you could argue back to me would be, Quinn, you're working with cadmium bromide. You're working with ether, collodion. You're working with KCN. You're working with all these very dangerous compounds. Yes, those can be mitigated, though. You can, you can take steps. Uh, preventative steps from being injured with those or by those, if if you're cognizant and aware of them. Um, silver foam for me to put a, a beaker of silver on a heat pad or a heat heat uh, stove and heat it up without knowing exactly the components and knowing exactly where I'm at um, with that. I see guys trying to make make collodion or nitrocellulose. It's not really collodion at that point. It's nitrocellulose. It becomes collodion when you add the solvents. Making nitrocellulose, very dangerous. Uh, silver, nitric acid fumes and silver fumes, they're very, very volatile compounds. Unless you have a fume hood and you're a chemist and you know all this stuff, this stuff is very dangerous. So what I'm saying is that while you can develop your own methodology and figure out how this process works for you, I'm not saying follow my advice you know, if you don't like hand pouring or if you don't like, you know, whatever it is that you don't like that I do or doesn't work for you, that's fine. That's that's terrific. And, and it applies to anyone else's teaching or methodologies as well. But what you don't want to do is get yourself in a jam where you're doing something that's dangerous. And there's a lot of things. And when I say dangerous, exposure to fumes, um, exposure to a, a volatile compounds, explosive, flammable compounds, poisonous compounds, they're all in there, right? We all deal with this. In fact, it's in, um, it's in Jay's article, uh, Dangers in the Dark. Um, he talks about it was more dangerous to be a wet collodion photographer in the 19th century than to go to the American Civil War. So that tells you how, you know, they didn't wear gloves. They had no ventilation. They, you know, it, it's, it's a, History is fascinating. The human, the human being progresses naturally, right? So we, we, we know how dangerous these compounds are. We know how volatile and flammable and explosive and all that. The only thing that, you know, I've got this big book um, by uh, um, the daguerreotype, the American, uh, God, I can't remember the name of it, and I don't have access to my books right now. Um, it's a great big tome, 500-page page, page daguerreotype book. And it was Southworth and Hawes is basically the premise. They were the premier based in Boston, Massachusetts, in the U.S. on the East Coast. They were kind of the premier studio for daguerreotypes in the 1840s. And, uh, and it's just amazing to me. People will push back sometimes when I, I, I'll give a lecture or talk about photography or whatever, invited somewhere and do a little spiel on history or something like that and, uh, and the process. And I, I include some of this sometimes. Uh, Southworth and Haas had a, a huge studio and daguerreotype studio in a, in a building in Boston on the top floor, huge, you know, uh, North Lit studio. And they were heating that mercury up all day long in that studio, developing plates with hot mercury. And if you look at the science on hot mercury, mercury is this big when it's cold, you know, and, and we all know quicksilver, or mercury, we all know the state of that. It's in a different state. You know, it's solid, liquid, and gas. It's in a different state depending on the temperature. But if you look at, just as an example, a lay example, if you look at mercury cold, it's that big. If you look at it heated, it expands like crazy and fills, fills areas up. And you know that hot mercury, the vapor from that, is, is a blood-brain barrier. It can go through your blood-brain barrier as you, as you, you, you won't smell it either, right? It'll just get into your system. You go through your blood brain barrier right into your brain. And that's what the, the Carol Lewis wrote about, right? In, in Alice in Wonderland, he was a wet plate collodion photographer. And he wrote about the mad hatters. These guys are standing over these big bins with the wooden canoe sticks, uh, 
uh, paddle sticks pushing these beaver pelts into these big heated vats of mercury with, with the pelts in them, right? And I'd smell that all day. And mad as a hatter. That's where that comes from. Mad as in crazy as a hatter making the beaver pelts for the hat. So there's uh, the only saving grace as I read about Southworth and Haas and their studio in Boston. The only saving grace for that. Why didn't they die? Why, why didn't they go crazy? And we don't know their complete history. We do know that Frederick Scott Archer died of liver disease. And we know what ether exposure does to your liver. You can kind of, you know, make a correlation there. It's not causation. It's just a hypothesis. We don't know. We don't have any medical facts on it. But you can draw that line real easy. <clears throat> but why did Southworth and Hawes work in that, in that studio heating plates up? All, and they did whole plate daguerreotypes. Whole plates. Huge, right, for daguerreotypes. So that's a lot of heated mercury in a, in a space. I don't care how big it is. The only saving grace is the construction was shoddy. The windows leaked. The doors were cracked. They had a lot of airflow through that stuff back in the day. They didn't build like today. You build a home or you they build an office and it is like, man, you are sealed up. You're hermetically sealed, basically. If they worked in that kind of environment back in the day, I don't know that they would have lasted six months, honestly. So there's <clears throat> there's a lot of there's a lot of safety issues. A lot of, uh, and those safety issues are dependent on how you work, what your methodology is, right? How is your ventilation set up? How do you, how, do you wear PP, do you wear protect, personal protective gear, right? Or equipment, PPE, you know, everybody knows that word now. Uh, we knew it before the COVID, but everybody knows PPE now, depending on, do you wear gloves? Do you wear glasses? Do you, what's your ventilation like? Do you understand the compounds you're working with and how you're handling them? Those all play in big time on the safety. And let's be honest, the quality of work that you do as well, too. So <clears throat> I don't mean to rant about safety this whole this whole time, but safety and methodology go hand in hand. Um, I'll get I'll get a, a message now and then that says, hey, Quinn, I know you do this this way, but I do it this way. Is that is that OK? And and again, it's 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 good that people reach out and say, am I, am I endangering myself or my family or my animals or neighbors if I do this, this way, and this can be anything. Right. Um, and, it, and, and if it, if it's something different and it's not dangerous, I like, go for it. I, I God, I have no corner on this market at all. I, I make plates. I figured out how to do this stuff. The best way it works for me, blah, blah, blah. And primarily the safety and quality issue being, being, um, being having the setting the precedence that's where you want to be you want to be safe you want to make good plates and you want to enjoy yourself you don't want to have uh you don't want to have bad things happen to you and you're the one in the driver's seat you're the one that's exposing yourself to these compounds over and over and over and over again you're the one that's uh, maybe in public demonstrating these processes uh, you're responsible for the people watching or around that that kind of thing so it's just some, something to keep aware of. And I'm, I'm not trying to be a, a parent or a father figure or anything. I'm just saying these are really dangerous compounds. And if you read Bill J's um, Dangers in the Dark, just download the PDF and read it if you haven't. That, that'll that change your philosophy about a lot of this stuff. It's, it's uh, man, I see these guys jump on these social media format uh, forums and they say some of the craziest shit that I've ever heard about this process i mean it's like this is this is somebody's going to get hurt <laughs> you know kind of thing and you know ignorance is bliss if you don't know any better it doesn't really it doesn't really mean much right so anyway that's kind of my rant for the day what, what do you guys have let's let's get you guys going and we can um let me let me see something here as you get warmed up for that let me see where we're um, danger. I'll try to find and post that link. Silo may have it actually. If you have the link, uh, maybe somebody posts that. Uh, um, and we'll just, I want everybody to, oh, there's excerpts from it. I have the PDF. If you want it, oh, there it is. Oh, this this is really good, yeah. 
So that, there's the PDF, and I'm going to back up, and I'm also going to send you this. This is a history of photography, too. Mrs. S. Stotch, I don't know who that is, but we'll post her little paper up there, too. I'm going to post it there, and I'll post it over here. So if you guys want to grab that, you can. It's well worth a read. Um, and then there, here's a, here's some a teacher's maybe a summary of uh, Bill Jay's work. I don't know for sure, but there's there's a couple links there. <clears throat> so one more. So okay. Anybody got anything? Anybody want to share anything? Talk about anything? I have to admit, my mind is a little bit on that track hoe over there. I have to admit. <laughs> No, we got nothing. We got nothing. Well, it happens sometimes. That's okay. Let's do this. I'm going to call it a day, and maybe next time we come back, we won't have the technical difficulties, and I won't be so crunched for time. Um, hello from Hong Kong, Matt Burley. Good to see you. Uh, we're just kind of closing shop maybe here, but... <clears throat> If somebody wants to share something, I'm completely open. We got a few minutes if you want to, but if not, that's fine too. But yeah, maybe next time we can uh, come in and we'll be a little bit, uh, bring some work in, um, bring some some photographs or send me some photographs, just bring them in. You, uh, I think I can have people share their screen. I'm not sure. Oh, here we go. Matt's got a question here. Let's do this. I watched your original videos. Uh, I'm not sure what those, oh, you mean the workshop videos probably. Um, is wet plate possible in human environment? That's a <clears throat> that's a fair question. Definitely is viable in a human condition, in human conditions. There are a couple of uh, kind of precautions you need to take and it's primarily in both um, the collodion, any temperature changes, and the varnishing. You'll have these, uh, what we call orange peel on the varnish. That's actually humidity, uh, condensate, or water in the air coming down onto the plate. It can happen on collodion. It can happen on the varnish. And when you get the varnish going, it gives little orange peels. And when you have it happen on a collodion, it'll slough the collodion off kind of thing, that, that kind of thing. So you do have to watch in human environments um, uh, those couple of things. And, and in general, um, I would say if you can use a dehumidifier when you're working, doing the varnish portion. And most of the time, if you're in the field <clears throat> um, or working remotely and it's humid, you can't have a humidifier. So you just need to work quickly, right? You need to, you need to make sure your methodology is good and you're safe and, and work quickly. But yes, very, very possible. Um, I've worked with it and I'll, I I went to China and made a bunch of work in China, very humid. Um, I lived in Germany at sea level, very humid and wet and rainy. Um, and some of that light is just absolutely stunning. So take advantage of that, but be aware that there are some precautions. Just like it, Matt, if you would have written and said, hey, is it, is it, am I, I live in Death Valley, California. Is it possible to make wet plate in 120, in, in you know, Please. in uh, four? five degrees Celsius temperatures. Yeah, it's possible, but you're going to have to make some adjustments. It's the same thing, right? It's, we deal with the weather and the weather does affect this process, no doubt about it. Whether it's scumming and veiling, orange peels, uh, sloughing off, whatever it is, you're going to you're gonna quickly realize um, how to deal with that. And on top of that, there are some um, some chemical formulations you can you can mitigate some of this stuff with. I'll give you a quick example. I live in the Western United States. The other day, <clears throat> two days ago, we had humidity of nine percent, nine percent humidity, not ninety nine percent humidity. That is dry as a bone. What do you do with collodion in that? That's just like having ninety five percent humidity, like maybe what Matt's asking about. Well, what I do is I add a little extra alcohol to the collodion. Why do I add a little extra alcohol to the collodion? Because that alcohol has 5% water in it, and that will keep the collodion wet a little longer. So if you think and you turn that around, 
maybe you want a little less water in, in, in the alcohol that you use in these really high humidity areas to make wet collodion as well. So you can kind of deduce and figure out the chemistry and, and make adjustments accordingly. It's, uh, it's, there's not a whole lot you can do. There's a couple of things you can do, but at the end of the day, it's mostly working safely and quickly in those environments to get the plates made, really. That's, at the end of the day, that's what it is. But I'm telling Wait. you, you can use a dehumidifier when you're, you're, uh, when you're um, varnishing, it helps a lot. Yes, Jan. I uh, I work in a very ho humid uh, condition now in uh, autumn in Norway. It's uh, yeah. often uh, often up to ninety five, ninety eight percent humidity. That's what Matt and just posted. Matt said it's ninety eight percent humidity <laughs> in Hong Kong. Yes, and I it's very cold. So if I breathe close to the glass plate, then I got uh, foggy condense on it. Yeah, and then I take collodion on the top. And then the collodion stays in the silver box after. That's exactly, exactly right, Jan. That's what I was just saying. Yeah. My solution is try not to breathe against the plate and make the pl plate always uh, hotter than the uh, flowing area around exactly, you. Exactly. Exactly. Because hot plates evaporate uh, humanity. There not you go. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like, uh, it's it's like it's about thinking about uh, a cold beer taken from the freezer and go to the hot day with wet uh, hot uh, air and then the, you see it's uh, fogging. Yeah, we call the English mm. word for that is condensation. We call it condensation, yeah. where, where, the, where the air temperature brings out from from it changes the status that the compound of the water to a liquid form and it appears on the outside of the can or on the plate. You're right, Jan. Um, you maybe, Jan, I've got a great idea. Put a scuba gear outfit on and pour your plates and you, you're never breathing on the plate. There's no water, there's no, <laughs> that's what I, I mean. Try. <laughs> <laughs> Hold your breath <laughs> That's what I mean. People come up with these, these solutions and I say, look, if you're gonna add another piece of equipment to this, I'm sorry, I'm just not interested. I have so much equipment in this process. I want to get rid of some of it. If you have an idea to get rid of some of it and still make the safety. I, uh, I talked with a friend, a work plug friend, Wilson from Canada. He had yeah. the same problems because he have a studio, another place now. Yeah. And I talk about this wet plate uh, meteorology to him. And I tell him, try this. And I make a... Uh, a solution for this and uh, it's working so i can repost it again on uh, on the facebook site my solution for this great yeah and and really the really the solution in a nutshell if you guys didn't catch that the solution is to have the glass warm and we know that heat uh, evaporates water or liquid that way right so a little bit of heat on that will allow that to prevent the condensation from forming or the water from forming, like he's saying. I think it's quite rare, but it happens. And the people work in different environments all over the world with this. It's usually the hot, uh, humid areas that have the most problems, but the hot uh, or the cool, humid areas same set can have the same kind of problem. It's yeah. Not, it's not so good to see you take up the uh, plate from the silver box and all this silver layer, like alluvial layer, fall down. Yeah, and make all messy silver box. Yeah, <laughs> in English we call that sloughing off. That's sloughing off. Right. So yeah. whenever you have collodion slide off, your we call it sloughing off. So it means there was something underneath that collodion that wouldn't mm. allow it to catch the glass. So it sloughs. Then you got the whole mess. You got to clean in your silver bath. All that <laughs> yeah. bright yellow emulsion that you got to do something with, and <laughs> you can't put it down your drain. Yeah, it's it. Everybody runs into the same thing. That's the beautiful part about this. Everybody will know that come usually not not everybody that visits and or watches these videos but most of the people that watch these videos will know exactly what we're talking about when we talk about some of these problems that are very very common uh, but all to overcome sometimes you know it's hot here of course but still that could work thanks so much yeah yeah it's it's about it's about just uh, mitigating those uh, oh and Jan posted that in his uh, in the private forum there too yeah 60 to 90 percent yeah it's it's uh yeah it, it'll slough off of there for sure 
I like I like dry, dry, sunny, bug free, high elevation areas. That's what that's what I like. <laughs> I like those areas. So I don't have the humidity problem. I have the dry problem. I have the opposite problem, right? Every action, there's a reaction, that same kind of thing. So you can say, I have a problem in this geographic location because of this, you know, temp humidity and temperature. And I have the exact opposite because of this humidity and temperature. So so we can, we go round and round, but very, very possible. Been done a lot. Um, I've, I've worked in humid, dry areas. I worked in, you know, hot, cold. I've done, I've, I've tried it all and it seems to work. It seems to work. So yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Anything else? Let's see here. Um, yeah, please repost it, Jan. People will enjoy it. People want, you know, like I said, my answer or solution to something may not fit your needs, right? Um, Jan's solution may fit it better. <clears throat> Or or Joffrey's or some or, or Thilo somebody uh, working in the process or interested in the process or knowledgeable about the process would be able to chime in and say, "Hey, try this or try that." You know, not again. We don't want to get back on that. I'm just guessing at this, and it could be dangerous and giving that poor advice. One day somebody's going to end up in court, and there's going to be a whole bunch of Facebook Facebook posts up there saying, you know do this, do this, and do that, and this person's injured or, God forbid, dead or hurt really bad, maimed, because they took somebody's advice that wasn't solid. So the caveat is, you know, buyer beware. Remember how to say that in Latin, right? Um, buyer beware. Just take the advice with a grain of salt, even mine. Um, qu question it. Check it out. Find the evidence for it. Um, and, and I go back to that silver fulminate thing all the time. I make it clear in my book that the risk, can you do it? Yes, you can do it. People do it, right? I work with KCN. I work with uh, Ether. I work with all that stuff. But their mitigation, I can store and handle and, and, and keep that safely. When I start putting a compound or multiple compounds in a beaker on a hot plate, not knowing what I'm doing can be end up very, very a terrible, terrible situation could happen, right? I mean, you could really do some damage. So I'm just saying, take everybody's advice with a, with a grain of salt. Do check it out, look at the evidence, see what the science says, see what the SDS or MSDS sheets say about these compounds. Read those. I encourage people to have those and read them. Re, you know, what's your exposure level? What's the acceptable level of exposure to these things? How do you store them? How do you handle them? What PPE gear, what, what personal protective equipment do you need to wear for any given compound? I get those questions a lot. Um, and, then, and I made a couple of safety videos on, but, but sometimes, you know, some weeks on social media, I just see things that just scare the hell out of me. People posting stuff and yeah, I don't know who these people are. I've never heard their names or seen. I used to know pretty much every name in the in the working in the wet plate world, and and nowadays there's just so many of them. I I have no clue. Yeah, caveat emptor. There you go. That's the Latin for buyer beware. There you go. Um, that's all I'm saying. Do I I posted this the other day, and I've said it a few times on here. If you believe anything without evidence, that's immoral, right? So don't don't skimp on the evidence. Know you know know the science. Do the research. Find out if that's legitimate. And I beg people to come back to me and say, "Give me the science on heating silver bath up, silver fulminate." I'm not talking about the effectiveness of it. It's absolutely effective. And why they do that is it's a really quick way to clean the bath. It'll in immediately get rid of the solvents. But you have those other compounds in there. You have some byproducts and nitrates from the double decomposition uh, uh, process in the silver bath. You've got the nitric acid that's that's in the silver bath, and then silver nitrate is made with that. And you've probably added some silver nitrate, and you've got the alcohol in there from the plates being dipped in there. So everything's perfect, and so you you run that big risk of of you know having some problems. But I've asked people, come back to me and show me the science that says this is safe. I can come back to you and show the science on handling KCN, potassium cyanide, or handling ether or, or, or 
uh, nitrocellulose or collodion. I can show you how you mitigate those safety issues. I, I can do that. I can show you the data on them. I'm, I'm asking people to come back to me with the data, the scientific evidence that it's safe. There are mitigation um, um, way, ways to mitigate that super unbelievably explosive material called silver fulminate. It is it scares the it scares the hell out of me. I, I just I won't go near it. So that's just my rant, though. You you find out for yourself and and know. And if you're if you're comfortable with heating up or boiling, I hate that word boiling silver bath. God, please don't. If you're comfortable with doing that, please you know make sure you're comfortable doing that. That's all. I'm I'm just I'm just waiting for a shoe to drop somewhere. I'm just waiting for to read about somebody's studio or in the backyard they blew up a bunch of shit because they were heating silver baths up or something. You know, I hope not. I real honest to God, I don't want anything bad to happen. But I want people to be aware of the risks they're taking working in this process. And that's I think that's why Bill J published that as well too. And he thought it was crazy. Of you know, he's he's died now, but it great writer. I don't know if you've ever read uh, a lot of his stuff, but it, what, anything you get on Bill J, read it. It's 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 good stuff. If you're a photographer um, and you work in these obscure processes, especially that dangers in the dark. So, anything else? Now that I got my safety round over, my wife would be proud, right? She's a uh, she's a uh, uh, her undergraduate degree degree is in um, safety engineer. She's a safety engineer. But her occupation was she was an industrial hygienist. So quick story. Maybe this gives me a little street cred. Quick story. My wife was doing what's called a preceptorship. When you're in graduate school, she was doing a master's of science in public health. When you're in graduate school, you go out in the field and you do these, you know, work things, these work studies. They call it a preceptorship. And she was on a military base. And I was running the photography studio. And she was on the military base doing air sampling qualities for um, air quality for for you know exposure to bad compounds. And uh, the person she was with was getting married, and he was taking his vac his uh, honeymoon was in the Bahamas, uh, the islands of Caribbean, and he wanted to go over to the photo department, and ask somebody what kind of underwater film or what kind of camera. You know, you got to remember this is back in 80, 88, 80, 88, somewhere in there, eighty eight, eighty nine, maybe. And uh, so she came over with him and that's where I met my wife. And she started talking about my dark room and that we should have some monitors on me and see what I'm being exposed to. But that's her profession. That was her profession. She hasn't worked in it for a long time, but that's what she did. So over the years, I'm, I'm very well aware. I don't want to die. I mean, I, I hope no one wants to die. I surely don't want to be sick or maimed. And I sure I don't want to hurt my family or friends or pets or neighbors or anybody else. So I've taken this the safety aspect seriously, but but with I don't compromise myself. My my images are fine. I still you know like I said I handle the cyanide fix. I handle the the, the explosive compounds, the the ether and the, the nitrocellulose, and there are ways to mitigate that. But I just can't. Once you start start talking about heating compounds up like this. You're, you're opening a whole Pandora's box of, of potential problems. I mean, I'm not a chemist. I just play one on a YouTube show sometimes on the weekend. But I, I know enough chemists, and I've, I've, I've gone through the literature. I've asked the questions, and I know what's safe and what's not. And I know how to mitigate. You're always taking a risk. There's never 100% sure. I'll give you that. If you want to argue about me handling cyanide and ether and you, you boiling your silver, I would make the argument that, that yes, you could make the argument you're never 100% sure. Of course you're not. I could have got out of bed this morning and tripped over my rug and hit my head and died, right? I mean, so don't get out of bed. There's risk assessment. You assess the risk, your knowledge, your, how comfortable you are and all that stuff, you assess that and then you work for it. I know plenty of people that will not touch potassium cyanide. They won't touch it. They won't touch cadmium bromide. Great, good reasons to do that. If you're assessing that you're not comfortable with that, don't do it. Don't do it. I would say maybe 
maybe your images may lack a little here or there or whatever, but maybe you'll find a way around that and make up for it. I don't know. But if you're not comfortable with it, if you've assessed the situation and you're not comfortable with it, don't do it. That's all I'm saying. So, and if you've really assessed the situation and you're comfortable with doing something, be prepared to give an answer for why you feel comfortable or how you've assessed that. And don't say because I read it on Twitter or something or social media. Don't, that is not an answer. That's that's another step in the dangerous walk down the path to one of Bill Jay's stories. And we don't want that. We don't want that. We want to stay safe and healthy and and hopefully come in here and talk about good stuff and not bad stuff. But every once in a while, we got to throw out that bad stuff just, just to keep it in people's minds, right? To throw a little stone in your shoe. Make sure you think about that the next time you, you know, think about doing this or doing that. Let's assess the risks, you know? Every time I go out in public, every time I'm around people, every time I'm mixing chemistry, I am completely aware of all of that because I only want good things for us. So that's all I have, gentlemen and ladies, if you're watching. Um, and if you want to send some work next week, I will be free and clear. I won't have any heavy equipment obligations, I, I don't think. <laughs> what I'm doing today is I'm putting big mounds of dirt over my water line. Soil's got a R1, R2 factor of insulation. So I don't know how cold the winter's going to be up here this year. So I'm just piling the, the dirt up all over my water line because my water goes on pretty soon and I don't want the water line freezing. So that's what I'm doing. You guys have a great weekend. Stay safe. And thanks for coming in and putting up with my techni technical difficulties. Um, Matt, what do you mean, how do you get in touch? You can you can send me an email at wetplate at gmail.com or go to studioq.com. And, uh, and again, I thank you for you guys that purchased my book this last week. I had a little uptick in it. Whoever you are, I appreciate it great. Well, I know one person, James, thank you if you're watching. Um, I appreciate the support on the book. I really do. I always do. And um, I appreciate your time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate your time. And I'll see you next Saturday, hopefully without any uh, glitches, and we'll look at some work. We'll look at some work. Ciao, ciao. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.